Okay, we welcome you to uh, this, the second and final of the um, plenary sessions. Uh, we started off with Jose Ramos Hoffa, and we now have the great fortune to hear uh, Bahashi, Joya Nusuma. Uh, Bahashi was, was born in Jakarta in um, 1954. Uh, he did his education in Malaysia, Europe, and graduated from Pomona College in uh, Clement in California, and um, has had a extremely um, varied and interesting career. Um, his particular interests have been in Indonesian history. They've been in the preservation of traditional uh, culture, education, um, and the environment wildlife protection in particular. Um, to that end, he has set up the Yayasan Asari, Joya uh, His wife, who is here today, Ani Hashim, um, has set up the Wada Foundation with particular <coughs> interests and particular focus on the sport and development of education, the welfare of those who actually teach, and public health and children's nutritional needs. Today, the presentation will be in three parts. The first part will be a very brief, succinct uh, presentation by Pak Hashim himself on the s drive to find a sustainable model of development so that a businessman like Pak Hashim can actually make money but at the same time uh, engage in activities which sustain the planet. And this uh, particular presentation was made for the first time at the um, Conference of Parties uh, meeting in Paris in December of last year, and it is on YouTube. So uh, the the essence of this can be can be downloaded. So we will hear a succinct presentation of 20-25 minutes. There will then be a a chance to actually put images to the various <coughs> issues and places which are mentioned, and then we have the chance to have a question and answer session which can be quite open-ended. So without further ado, it's my deep pleasure to welcome you here. I know you go to Cambridge a lot, so this is the first time we've actually got you here, which is very good news. Thank you. Yeah. My involvement in the palm oil industry dates from even earlier to 1983, 
whereas my involvement in the oil and petrochemical industries began later in 1993. In 1997, my group acquired oil fields in Kazakhstan, followed by acquisitions in Azerbaijan, the United States, Brunei, and Indonesia itself. I have since divested all of the above, except for palm oil and tin mining. The point I'm making is that although I have made and lost fortunes in these heavy polluting businesses, I have come to the conclusion that there is a very exciting future in investing in environmentally friendly businesses, at the same time restoring and protecting endangered wildlife while making a healthy profit. In my opinion, a sustainable environment can only be possible if it is financially profitable and supported by the local human population. Climate change is nothing new, and the deniers of climate change rightly point out that the Earth's climate has changed numerous times over the past four and a half billion years up to the arrival of Homo sapiens. Indeed, evidence shows that carbon is currently being emitted naturally through cracks in the Earth's crust, for example, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the Sea of Cortez, just to name a few. It has recurred for the past thousands of years before the Industrial Revolution and the use of fossil fuels. I have come to accept the conclusion of the overwhelming majority of scientists that the difference this time is that human activity has accelerated the warming of the planet at such a rate that severely imperils the landscapes, seascapes, human and animal habitats. My con concern and passion for wildlife was the major catalyst for my conversion to the perils of climate change. I saw the continued destruction of animal, animal habitat by natural causes, as well as forest fires and criminal corporate behavior, and I searched for practical ways to not only protect, but also to restore animal habitat in the rainforests. The problem of degraded and destroyed forests in Indonesia is daunting. Until recently, I had thought it was hopeless. The latest figures in 2015, released by the Indonesian Ministry of the Environment and Forestry, show that 88 million hectares is now classified as degrade, degraded or destroyed. This implies a rate of destruction of about 2 to 3 million hectares per year. At this rate, Indonesia will become completely devoid of forest cover within the next 25 years. Given this prospect, there's every reason for gloom and despair, especially given successive Indonesian governments seeming inability to stem the tide of destruction. Not only animals died of lots of smoke and fires, indeed many human beings, especially children and the elderly, died as well. However, there is hope. There is light in this dark tunnel as new solutions present themselves. In 2008, I visited a remarkable project in East Kalimantan province called Samboja Lestari. This was a new site for an animal sanctuary and rehabilitation center for orangutans and sun bears. This by itself is nothing new, as there are several other such sites doing much the same activities. Samboja Lestari, however, is unique in that the entire 1,800 hectares or 4,500 acres forest had been six years before on complete wasteland of wild grass and weeds, totally devoid of trees, water, and both animal and human habitat. There were no birds or animals except for rats. A group of wildlife enthusiasts, led by a remarkable and brilliant scientist by the name of Dr. Willie Smith, started an experiment to restore the semblance of a rainforest by planting trees in a biodiverse, following cultural manner, planting up to 1,200 species of plants and trees. In other words, polyculture, not monoculture. The key was to plant numerous species of fruit trees to enable the sustained return of birds and mammals to the green growing forest. When I first visited in 2008, Samboja Lastari was only in its sixth year of replanting. It has now been an unqualified success. The animals, birds, and insects, such as butterflies, have returned to a forest which six years before was a barren, inhospitable tropical desert. 
The rain since then has returned because the growing forest has caused moisture levels to increase dramatically. I became a true believer as I saw the place grow over many visits in over the past eight years. It is now in its 14th year of restoration and growth. Restoring the rainforest over such a short period of time has now been proven possible. The accepted paradigm had been up to that time that reforestation would take decades. It would take decades of laborious, commercially unprofitable work to restore degraded rainforests. It would be akin to the philanthropy and charity. The science of fast, biodiverse, multi-species or polyculture reforestation has now been proven by Samboja Lestari. The question remains, how can we reforest 88 million hectares of degraded rainforest sustainably? It costs about $2,500 to $2,700 to reforest a hectare of degraded land, and we also have to make sure that returning wildlife would not pray to fall prey to hungry and poor landless humans. The key is to plant commercially viable trees and plants to enable investors to make a decent profit within a reasonable time frame while at the same time creating the conditions where humans living in the vicinity of the growing forest are incentivized to protect it by making a dignified living from the proceeds of the forest itself. In other words, agroforestry. Indonesia, my homeland, is home to a unique remarkable plant called the palm sugar tree or the Latin scientific term uh, Arenga pinata, which technically is not a tree. And I'll leave that to the scientists and forestry experts here to explain. The palm sugar tree has many unique characteristics, the principal one being that it secretes a sugary juice which can, process, can be processed into an ethanol for energy, as well as a sugar well suited for those who suffer from diabetes because its glycemic index is under 30, whereas white refined sugar has an index above 60. Studies have shown that a hectare of palm sugar forest can produce a minimum of three times more sugar than a hectare of cane sugar. A hectare of palm sugar forest can produce a minimum of 20 tons of ethanol compared to seven tons from a sugar cane plantation. And the palm sugar tree can secrete all year round 365 days a year, providing year-round employment. The sugar cane plantation provides employment for only half a year for sugar cane farmers. However, for me, the most exciting feature is that the palm sugar tree can only grow well and secrete juice properly in a polyculture forest environment. In other words, the tree thrives on diversity and stunts in uniformity. This is very great news for wildlife, which needs fruit trees to provide sustenance. Palm oil does not provide the sustenance needed for wildlife and is therefore the very antithesis of biodiversity. New technologies such as torrefaction will produce black pellets from waste biomass, such as twigs, branches, leaves, palm oil waste bunches, that can be a substitute for coal. Torrefaction is like roasting wood at very high temperatures, which produces black pellets with 95% of the calorific value of coal, but without the carbon. When mixed with coal, the pellets enable power plants significantly to reduce carbon emissions. Gas can also be produced by a new technology derived from torrefaction that will enable the production of biodegradable plastics that do not compete with food as do corn bioplastics. <clears throat> this new biomass gas technology can also produce jet fuel, LPG, LNG, fertilizers, and such like, from a sustainable, perpetual, undepleted resource, the palm sugar mixed forest. A significant feature is that these can be economical at the equivalent price of $40 to $50 per barrel of oil. In other words, these biomass gas products can be produced at an affordable cost. Another product from these mixed forests is biochar, which is a fertilizing medium produced from burning waste wood <coughs> at certain temperatures. 
The result is an organic fertilizer which tests have shown can increase productivity exponentially without the use of chemical fertilizer from fossil fuels. The palm sugar forest can also absorb huge amounts of carbon from the atmosphere because the roots of the tree extend 12 meters into the soil, potentially enabling gigatons of carbon dioxide to be sequestered deep into the ground. What other advantages does Indonesia and other <coughs> similar tropical countries have? In short, the following. One, sunshine all year round. Two, abundant and regular rainfall. Three, sizable tracts of land. And four, large populations able to work and harvest palm sugar in mixed tropical rainforests. <coughs> because of these favorable factors, Indonesia has the potential to reforest extensive tracts of degraded forest, produce sizable amounts of the undepleted energy, and pri provide employment for huge numbers of people with a dignified way of life and a living wage. <coughs> McKinsey and Company, the renowned international consultancy, was recently com commissioned by the Norwegian government to do a strategic review and due diligence on the palm sugar forest concept. They came to the conclusion not only were its objectives feasible, but also that it was financially viable with an internal rate of return of more than 25%, that is per annum. McKinsey was so favorably impressed that they suggested that not should be this model be applied to Indonesia but that Nigeria should be considered as also as the next location for the palm sugar reforestation project. <clears throat> the Tanzanian government has already expressed interest in applying the concept in restoring Tanzania's many deforested regions. But McKinsey suggested that Nigeria, with a population projected to increase fivefold from 180 million today to 800 million people by 2100, <coughs> and already importing food with a fast depleting forest and fossil fuel resources, Nigeria would be a prime candidate for this model of reforestation. This is because the palm sugar reforestation model has one of its many plants, the cassava, which in Africa, as well as Indonesia, is a food staple for many local populations. According to calculations, we believe it is possible to replace Indonesia's current consumption of oil and oil products, about 1.6 million of barrels of oil equivalent per day, with 8 million hectares of palm sugar forest. Products from forests over and beyond 8 million hectares could be used for export to countries determined to reduce their carbon emissions. According to some estimates, there are today some 1.2 billion hectares of degraded forest throughout the globe. Much of this is found in temperate zones such as here in Europe, where the climate is not suitable for growing palm sugar trees and the type of tropical forest food trees which support wildlife. However, at least 540 million hectares is found in a tropical zone, and theoretically all this, except for peat soil, could accommodate mixed forests with palm sugar and fruit trees. But as can be seen, I have limited my discussion to my experience with forest and land environments. I have not delved into the very relevant topic of the marine environment. In my ex opinion, given that the government does not have sufficient financial resources to act alone, the corporate tax sector has a very important role. Only this sector, working in conjunction with the government, can ensure that sufficient investments are made in renewable energy. By finding the right formula for restoring the forest environment, we can incentivize local populations to protect both the forest environment and its fauna. Self-interest is always the most compelling reason to do anything, especially when it comes to doing the right thing. Thank you very much, Peter. And I'm willing to take questions after a slideshow. I guess we're going to have about five minutes. <coughs> Seeing is believing, and um, we decided to keep the slides after my speech so it would not uh, uh, distract from my speech. But so basically, what we are trying to do in Indonesia 
is to apply new technologies <coughs> that we hope will slow down global warming. Um, we believe that there is a place for other renewable energies, uh, uh, such as forest, uh, sorry, as wind, wind power. Um, we have uh, ample resources of, uh, of geothermal energy in Indonesia. Um, uh, we have huge amounts of sunlight, but we believe that the only way, uh, the only way we can actually uh, reduce, or let's say decarbonize, that was a term that Professor Jeffrey Sachs used in, in uh, Paris in December, to actually decarbonize the atmosphere. The only way, we think, is by massive uh, reforestation throughout the world. And this is, what the, the, this is basically what I'm presenting to you today. Can, can, the next slide. Um, this is just, uh, just to, to make the point that um, there's, there's a, a lot of examples around the world, especially in Indonesia, of rising sea levels because of, of uh, melting ice all over the world, especially on the north and south uh, uh, poles. Next. I was, as Peter said, I was a member of the Indonesian delegation to the climate change conference in Paris, where 170 countries were present. And uh, I think it was almost like a miracle that, uh, that an accord was actually signed by all, the, by all those participants. So we were actually quite proud of the achievements. Uh, now, these, all these photos um, were actually, most of them come from, from the forest areas that, that, that my group owns in Indonesia. This actually is photos from our, our, um, uh, our forest. These trees actually still exist. These are, these are big trees, Agathus uh, borneensis, which uh, it goes up to the height of 80 to, to 100 meters. And some of the trees in my forest concession are still uh, very old. Some of them are 800 years old. Uh, there was a, a thousand year tree which actually fell uh, of old age, not because of, of, of uh, uh, cutting, but th these are the things that we, we would like, we like to replicate again. Um, this is also from our rainforest that we've kept intact. This is also from our rainforest. And this again is also our rainforest. I, I, I mentioned to you earlier, like, that Indonesia in a tropical, <laughs> The tropical zones, the, tropical, the countries in the tropical zone have a, a, a tremendous advantage. As I mentioned earlier, we have year-round sunshine, we have constant rain, we have suitable soils, we have the land, and we have the people. At the moment, many of the people are unemployed or underemployed, and we those that will become a huge resource for reforestation uh, and, and our model of reforestation. At the moment, we have interest from uh, companies in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Japan, who are interested to, uh, highly, highly interested in, in, uh, in buying the black pellets that I talked about, uh, the tor affected black pellets, which actually use biomass waste. So the resource will be biomass waste. <coughs> this is the area that we control and we own in East Kalimantan. We'll be producing uh, ethanol, we'll be producing uh, the tor affected products, uh, we'll be producing cassava from forests that we uh, we intend to reforest in this way. Next. All these photos are from our area. You can see uh, the, the wildlife, the birds, the insects, uh, which are so, so unique to the tropical rainforest. And this is what we intend to, to uh, we intend to provide the habitat again for endangered species. Next. The scientific term, so, look, look, body body, body, yeah. the, the scientific term um, for the palm sugar tree is Arenga pinata. Now I've been told by scientists that the, the palm sugar tree is not technically a tree. It's actually a plant which looks like a tree. But I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a biologist, no, I'm, 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 I'm not a zoologist, so I really don't know. But that, um, it, it's not a tree, but it looks like a tree. And it, it is the, the key to our uh, model of reforestation because it, it actually will be producing and can produce a lot of uh, sugary juice which can produce the ethanol as a source of energy. Next. That, those four photos actually show the, the palm sugar tree or plant, Adega pinata. It's not uh, the palm oil plant that has become so uh, <coughs> 
uh, infamous or notorious in many parts of the world. Next. This is a biochar, or an example of a biochar, which is a medium uh, for, uh, for fertilizer. Um, and this biochar, uh, we have proven in tests, can provide, actually produce uh, and uh, exponential production uh, without using uh, fertilizer from fossil fuels. Next. These are actually uh, examples of the facilities that we use to produce the biochar. I mean, not really a rocket science. I mean, these are technically called rocket stoves. But, as you can, as you can see, as you can see, nothing particularly sophisticated about it, but it produces this biochar, which is an amazing, amazing medium. And these are just examples of all the plants that we've uh, actually tested and as part of the program. We've tested it and we've proven the concept. And we believe that we can actually reforest uh, Indonesia and large parts of the world without using uh, chemical fertilizer. This looks a modular study. This is actually, I think, the most interesting part of, the, of my presentation today. So modular stari, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, was actually a tropical wasteland. It was 1,800 hectares of basically wild grass and weeds. Nothing grew there, nothing lived there except rats. Um, and this is example. This is actually uh, the modular stari which has been recreated and reforested. And you have, in fact, um, hundreds of orangutans which use and live there as a sanctuary. Sumodula Stari, this is a map of Sumodula Stari, it's in East Kalimantan province. Um, a complete recreation of the tropical rainforest with 1,200 species of trees. Now, I was skeptical of this whole concept until I visited Sumodula Stari and I became a convert. I became a true believer in the concept because I've seen it. And I've seen it grow, you know, in front of my eyes. This was in 2001. Um, I did not start the project, it was Dr. Willie Smith and his team. As you can see, in 2001, it was a barren wasteland. The tropical forest had been cut down, had been burned you know, by, by actually natural forest fires. There were the forest fires in 1982 and 1997. And in 2001, you could see that this... Yeah, don't tell you, but Yeah, this is 2001. Next slide, yeah, stand with it. And this was in 2006. This is one year before I visited the project. And you can see the forest growing in its fifth year, in its uh, fourth year. And this was in 2014, two years ago. As you can see, the rainforest has basically reappeared. So it's taken. You know, in this in 2004, it's 12 years, which, in the in the opinion of many experts, was almost impossible because the previous paradigm was reforestation and a monoculture basis. Basically, the Indonesian government would say we would plant one million trees. They would plant one million of the same type of tree. You know, that was the previous paradigm you know, adopted by the Indonesian government. Basically, monoculture. Here. What Willie, Dr. Willie Smith, who's become a friend of mine and a partner of mine, um, he supplied a different concept, which is now it's polyculture. It's a biodiverse polyculture. And what has happened is that the rain has come back. In 2001, there was hardly any rain in that area. The rain came back because the new forest attracted moisture. And then the moisture caused the rainfall. And in fact, what has happened is that Studies have shown that actually the groundwater levels increased. The groundwater, the aquifers have been replenished. The rain has come back. It keeps on raining. Because of the rain and the, and, and the vegetation and the fruits, the, the animals come back. The birds come back. The butterflies come back. The insects have come back. The, reef, the, the, the rainforest has been recreated in just basically 12 years. Next. This is 2015, a few months ago, we took this picture. That is not smoke, that's basically, that's mist, by the way. That's mist, not smoke. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to say that. Um, 
As you can see, the, the forest has been, has been recreated, has been restored. Next. The plants have come back, and the orangutans have a new home. Um, very exciting. This, this to me is the proof of concept. This to me is the vision that we have uh, for Indonesia. And we believe we can do it, and we can replicate it around the world. And uh, as I mentioned in my talk earlier, uh, McKinsey wants us to do Nigeria. Um, I just met a friend of, uh, a new friend from Cameroon. Apparently in Cameroon, I found out that they have the same problem that Nigeria has. Uh, massive deforestation, they're looting out the, for the forest cover, uh, population explosion. We believe that with the restoration of the rainforest based on this model, of mixed forest reforestation, we can actually provide the food. Because cassava will be one of the crops, one of the plants we'll be planting here. We'll do it on a rotation basis because cassava uh, is known as a plant which, uh, which depletes the nutrients from the soil. So we'll do it on a rotation basis. Um, and we believe that we can actually provide food resources uh, to the population of Indonesia and, and Africa and other tropical zones. Unfortunately, we cannot apply this to the temperate zones. We can't do it in Siberia or, or in England or in Canada or North America. We can do it in the tropical zones, but that's still 540 million hectares that we, can, we think we can, uh, we can reforest. Budget? Yeah, this is the same, some modular study. Some modular study. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm willing to take uh, questions. In fact, I was told we have uh, two hours for this, so thank you time for So thank you very much, Pakachi, for uh, extremely uh, hopeful vision for Indonesia and also for the tropical world. 120 million hectares, 88 million. 1.2 billion. 1.2 billion. billion. Around the world. 540 in the top of the Okay. So we can open it out, and I suggest we, we take a clutch of questions. The gentleman over there in the back. Yep. Does this work? Can you hear me, or should I? Yes. You can hear you loud and clear. Yes. Press this. Well, I'll talk lot loudly. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was interesting to hear about the positive contributions that palm oil industry can make, particularly. No, no, uh, not palm oil. Not only palm oil, but no, the no, sugar. No, palm, palm, palm sugar. Palm sugar. Palm sugar. Palm sugar. Uh, what I want to uh, ask more about is particularly um, the palm oil industry and the downsides of this industry uh, uh, in terms of the land conflicts that is causing the uh, considerable deforestation that you mentioned, uh, as well as the forest fires that have been caused um, by this. Um, um, one reason of this downside has been the management practices of palm oil, palm oil companies in Indonesia who did not always fully abide by the moratorium that has been declared, who uh, worked on peat plant soil where they shouldn't, or drain the land where, uh, which contributes to uh, forest fires. Um, now my question is, there have been initiatives to get palm oil companies to agree to a higher level, higher standard of management, uh, including a recent one called the Indonesia's Palm Oil Pledge. To my surprise, many others, only a few but big companies signed up to this, uh, Musimas, Cargill. Um, but as far as I know, the companies that Bahashim is involved in has not done so. And I'm, my first question is, why not? Um, second question is, there has been a considerable backlash inside Indonesia against these more progressive companies, in the sense that um, companies that did so were threatened by the Indonesian government for revoking their licenses, as well as investigation by legal teams. Um, and the suspicion is that it is done by uh, or stimulated by the palm oil lobby industry who feared an increasing cost if they were held to higher accounts, um, which is basically a regressive 
practice which would <coughs> stimulate a further, would prevent a solution for these problems that I mentioned. So the second question is, could not more be done to prevent this kind of conservative lobby uh, uh, and support the palm oil pledge? Thank you. Right. Um, I think the first question I don't really understand because you're asking me my companies are not uh, are not uh, taking part in that program. I, I don't understand that question. That's the question. Why yeah, which, which why why are you not uh, taking part in that program? I, I'm, I'm my my involvement in palm oil is minimal. I, I'm I'm one of the smallest players in the palm oil business. In fact, I'm. I'm converting my palm oil plantation into palm sugar. Palm sugar. So I, I'm not. I don't think. I think you have other people in mind, not me. But you could. But you could support it. And you of could. Course. Your company is big or small. You could. Yes, have them you are supporting it. Yes. So I don't understand why. You know, because I've, I've actually been very harsh on the palm oil lobby. Right? The palm oil. In fact, we had a meeting a few weeks ago, and I was quite critical of GAPKI, which is the Palm Oil Association. So. Mm -hmm. I, I think you've got the wrong person or group of companies because I'm, I'm really a very minor player in the palm oil business. Well, but, okay, but maybe you're answering the question. You say you, your companies would join if asked. Yes, of course. Okay. In fact, you, we're one of the major proponents of that. You know? <coughs> so um, I think you've got the wrong person. Okay, but you, you're not on the list of the palm oil pledge. Your, your small companies. Yes, yeah, so I've never been asked to join. In fact, I'm, I'm changing. I'm, in fact, I'm converting my palm oil plantation to palm sugar. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I don't understand why. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't <coughs> been asked. Nobody's asked me. Okay. Okay. That's so that's good. point number one. So the question number two is, uh, what was the, your, the question number two? I, I. What can be done about the backlash against these, these attempts to keep palm oil companies to a higher standard? Um, you know, uh, the palm oil lobby is very powerful in Indonesia. It's very powerful. Um, there's, 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 there's always this argument that the Palm Oil Association says that they, they employ a lot of people, a lot of smallholders. Uh, in fact, they're talking about 10 to 15 million smallholders whose livelihoods are actually derived from palm oil. So they actually use that. So the big companies, the big plantation companies always use the argument that smallholders are actually dependent on the industry. So that's one of the reasons why there's this uh, reluctance to, to, um, to crack down. On, on my, when I mentioned in my talk criminal corporate behavior, you know, I, in fact, at a meeting that we had with the Norwegian Minister of Environment just about a month ago, I was the one at the meeting who actually said that palm or some palm oil companies actually encourage landless peasants to go into uh, Hutan Lindung uh, national parks and protected parks uh, in the guise of landless peasants and landless farmers taking over um, you know, the land. And then if we find out, you know, there's anecdotal evidence, anecdotal evidence that in fact, palm oil companies and their owners actually encourage this sort of behavior. You know, so, so in a way, um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not condoning it. In fact, I'm condemning it. But yes, there's a huge uh, lobby uh, which actually resists and, and contributes to the to the slow, uh, you know, the governmental uh, measures to combat it. So, you know, uh, I'm pro I'm providing today. I'm telling you today. There's a different model. Which I'm trying to, to promote, you know, and it's uh, it's a different model. In fact, uh, it's something that uh, we think will mitigate, you know, and co maybe correct the the behavior of palm oil companies because the palm oil companies have co have committed to the government. Twenty percent of their palm oil plantations will be converted into mixed forest. Now they don't know how to do it because they don't know how to make money out of doing it. So this is one way. We think that we can actually provide a solution where we can do and restore in a biodiverse way. We provide a habitat for wildlife, and yet basically providing a, 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 a living wage for farmers uh, from this new, uh, new uh, mixed forest. I don't know whether I, I answered your question, but uh, 
So yeah. uh, um, I think that, you know first I think you got the wrong person. Yeah, because I, you know I'm I, you know I'm not really in 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 the palm oil business. Frankly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think um, we can help in this discussion because you have experience at this point of at least beginning to convert the palm oil plantations that you had into the palm sugar and mix for us. Um, so the question is, when you do that, or if we were to ask the palm oil industry to increasingly do that, what is the economics of that? I mean, in a sense, does that mean that they are, in a sense, going to relinquish their, prof their, their profits over maybe a dozen year period for that land? Um, um, question one. Question two, then, um, in terms of the amount of income which is generated from that land from the mixed forest, would they then be worse off? Um, and um, third, um, you know, could perhaps, if there is a disadvantage, could perhaps a sensible thing for the government to do is to provide subsidies for these companies to increasingly convert over a period of time. I mean, I, what I hope I'm doing is entering in very fully into your argument that, in fact, we need to make this shift. Um, what would be necessary to reduce the power of the poor palm oil industry by effectively bringing them over to your position? You know, I, there's always the argument you know, whether you use the carrot or the stick. Um, yeah. One can use the stick, uh, but, you know, frankly, there's a lot of collusion. You know, between these companies and you know, government officials at the, especially at the local levels. You know, I'm not talking about the, the, the central government, the local level. So let's let's be perfectly clear and about and be realistic about that. Um, I prefer to incentivize people. I think if you can make it in their self-interest to do the right thing, as I said, I think the last sentence of my speech, to do the right thing is always the best way, in my opinion. You know, and and that way they would do it because it's in their selfish self-interest to do it. And I think this model that I'm presenting to you today, that we, we, we presented in Paris three, four months ago, provides that alternative. You know? And I said that they have committed, the palm oil companies have committed 20% of their land area would be for mixed use and, and biodiverse uh, reforestation. They don't, they don't know how to do it at the moment. So they basically, they, they're calling us because we, we think we have the solution. We've tried it, we, we, it works. So we think we have the solution. And you know, we, at the moment, there's estimates about 10 and a half million hectares of land under cultivation by palm oil companies in Indonesia. So they're committed to do 20% of that, which is plus or minus 2 million hectares. That's a start. And once they find out how profitable it can be, and we, we made some, some, uh, some calculations. Uh, McKinsey did a, a study on our, uh, our model and they think we can get at least 25% IRR on our model, whereas in palm oil it's 19%. You know, so you know a, 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 a clear-headed businessman, you know, looking at the facts and looking at the numbers, will say, "Hey, we can make this much more money, and we can do the right thing." In my opinion, you know, granted, not all businessmen have a particular interest in wildlife. I do, and that's how I came to this. You know this conclusion because of, of my interest in wildlife. The problem is I've been spending so much money on wildlife preservation activities, and then it can, you know, it's just been going. The money has been going and going and on, and that's one we had to find a solution. Is how do we actually make it sustainable? How do we find a source of revenue to actually provide the funds for wildlife protection and so forth? And we think we found a happy medium. We think we can do both. You know, it's not a zero sum game. It's a win win. In my opinion. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for asking for the uh, interesting talk. So I want to ask first question is about the Sam Mojalatari project. Mm -hmm. So I guess we are talking about billion of hectares there uh, that we are talking about in Indonesia. Mojalatari? So sorry? No, 1,800. Yeah, but in terms of Indonesia, we are talking a lot of land. So what do you think about the scalability in terms of financial aspects, <coughs> government bureaucracy, and are they scalable, basically? And what are the time scale that we are talking about? Okay. Uh, so, yeah. second right. so, second question is about uh, less related to this talk, tangent a bit. A bit. So, about solar cells. So, as you mentioned, Indonesia has 
we have ample amount of uh, sunlight throughout the year. So, do you have any comment on that uh, solar cells, or has it been given any consideration? Thank you very much. Okay. I think the, the, the easy one is the second question. So, yes. Uh, in fact, I mean, I'm going to be investing as well in, in, solar, in uh, solar power. Uh, I'll be working together with the French oil company, Total. They, the Total, in my opinion, is one of the most progressive oil companies. Not all, most oil companies are not progressive. Total, in, in my opinion, I was quite surprised how progressive they are. They have invested billions and billions and billions of euros and dollars into, into, the, oil, into the solar power uh, uh, space, as well as biomass. So we're going to do that with, with the, the French. And there's another American company which wants also to do solar power. The Indonesian government is heavily committed to solar power and renewables, and all forms of renewables. So in the Indonesia, there's, there's actually a, a glimmer of hope. You know, the Indonesian government is fully committed uh, to renewables. Um, unfortunately, they're also committed to nuclear power. So that's another <laughs> that, that is considered renewable. You know, I, I don't believe that, but anyway, that's, that's something that they, So that's, that's the positive. Um, on, and your, your first question, is it scalable? Yes, it is scalable. And um, Symbodula Star is 1,800 hectares, but it's been done, it's been proven, it's been, and it can be done very quickly. That's the, 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 the most important point. It doesn't take 30, 40, 50 years to reforest. It can take 10, 12, 14 years to reforest. Okay. And with uh, this model, you know, this mixed forest model, using multiple species, of commercially sustainable uh, plants and trees. Um, we think we can do it. In fact, we've talk, uh, the Transcendent government is very keen on doing this. Um, the, uh, McKinsey, as I said, would, would like us to do in Nigeria. Uh, it can be done in the tropical zone. Do you think it's financially sustainable? Because like, it's a huge project, basically. Yeah. Yes, it is. It, the IRR is estimated between 25 and 31%. Okay. So, uh, I can tell you, a 25 to 31% IRR is very, very attractive. It's very attractive. In fact, I can tell you quite a few investors have approached us. They want to invest in this, in this, uh, in this model. So, and these are people who are, you know, from Wall Street. These are people, you know, climate change now seems to be a sexy thing. People who didn't care for climate change, didn't care for the environment, they want to make money. And they think they can make a lot of money in environmentally doing the right thing. So I think it's a it's a win-win situation. Not sure if some games win-win is great. It's incentivizing uh, investors to do the right thing. You know, so there seems to be a large pool of environmentally friendly, environmentally aware people um, who want to invest. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, you, you know some of these people. I mean, the names Richard Branson is one name. Uh, uh, Jeremy Grantham, who's uh, an Englishman based in Boston, he's another. George Soros is another. Bill Gates is another. In fact, I've been invited to Necker Island in the next few months to meet these gentlemen. They seem to be, they've heard about this, they're, they're interested, they want to do the right thing and make money. And in my opinion, that's the only way it's sustainable, you know, because otherwise it becomes charity. And frankly, you know, not, uh, you'd be surprised how few people are interested in charitable projects. <laughs> you know, it's sobering to me, but... Yes, sir, uh, in the middle. <coughs> Thank you, Pasi. Uh, will this model also work in a uh, peat soil, um, a degraded peat soil area in, in our country? Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, no. This model will only work in 70% of Indonesia's soil. 70%. Which is a lot. So if you have 90 million, 88 million hectares of degraded forest, we think we can do 70% of that. So 70% of 90 of 88 is 60 million. That's already a good start, right? Um, and then we, we think we can do the other parts of the world which are non peat as well. So that's that's the, the thing we cannot do. I mean, uh, we have tested it, we tried it. It cannot peat. Uh, palm sugar doesn't grow very well in this one. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Just to ensure we're not repeating problems that have occurred in the past, you've talked about trying this project in other parts of the world. Are you replanting with native plants? 
I mean, if you take this to yes, uh, so the idea the years. idea would be to do the fruit trees which are native to Africa, for instance. If you were to do it in Nigeria, it would be native uh, African fruit trees. In Cameroon, it would be you know Cameroon uh, uh, native to the Cameroon, native to Tanzania. Uh, the only thing that would be invasive uh, would be the palm sugar tree. But remember, rubber. It was not, it's not native to Indonesia. The rubber tree in Indonesia is one of the major rubber producers. Rubber came from Brazil. The palm oil tree is not native to Asia. It's actually from West Africa. It's from the Ivory Coast. It's from, uh, yeah, the Ivory Coast. It actually came, uh, the British and the French actually brought the palm oil, and the Belgians, by the way, they brought the palm oil tree to Asia. <coughs> so that's the only tree which is not native to Africa, but we. Uh, the Tanzanians are, I, I seem to be very keen on this because um, one of the things I really haven't mentioned very much is the fact that the palm sugar tree um, stores a lot of water. It stores a lot of water. In fact, it's a very uh, prolific source of water. And so when you have, it, it, it restores the water resources of, of deforested areas. And that's why the Tanzanian government is very keen on this because Tanzania apparently has a huge desertification problem uh, because uh, there are very few um, local sources of energy. Uh, the, the, the local Tanzanian people cut the, the trees down as, <coughs> for firewood, basically. And once the, for, the trees are cut down, the forests disappear, the rain stops, rain, no, the clouds stop raining, and the water disappears. So that's, that's the problem for Tanzania. And could be also for, for, for Cameroon. Sorry, that's one. Yes, yes ma'am. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, you've mentioned Nigeria, Cameroon. Uh, I was wondering of what is the potential of perhaps Indonesia leading this and other such initiatives within ASEAN. And one area that came to mind with regards to forest preservation was Borneo, which is shared by two other countries. And wouldn't it be needed, really, for a regional support for such initiatives for uh, it to really work. Yes, actually, um, when I gave my talk in Paris, uh, one of the persons in the audience was the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, uh, Badawi. Mm -hmm. uh, are you from Malaysia? But uh, the former Prime Minister was there, he, and the Minister of Environment was also there uh, from Malaysia. He was, they got very excited as well. We think we can do it all over Southeast Asia. We can, uh, one prime uh, uh, candidate would be the Philippines. Uh, because we know, uh, you know, for people who know the Philippines, you know, Luzon is also losing its, the main island of the Philippines is called Luzon. Uh, and Mindanao is the other main island. Those two islands are losing their forest cover uh, because of population pressure. And, and, and th we think, and other, in fact, we've talked to the people in the Philippines, they think this is, would be perfect for, for the Philippines. Res restoring the forest cover of the Philippines, providing a food source, you know, the cassava as a food source, providing energy to replace fossil fuels in the form of ethanol from the sugar tree, from the palm sugar tree. All these things can be provided as a local uh, solution, the, the local sources of energy and food. So Luzon, uh, the Philippines, uh, you know, my area is actually in, ba in Kalimantan. Kalimantan is the Indonesian word for Borneo. So, uh, you know, we could do that. In fact, um, India, southern India would be, would be, um, also suitable for, for this sort of solution. So that's, and of course Africa, and then um, uh, Haiti, the island of, well, island, island of Hispaniola, which is the, the uh, Haiti is the other, but one half. Haiti would be something that we'd like to start, you know, that's the idea to Haiti, southern Mexico, uh, Colombia, the Colombian government has shown interest. Um, so that part, you know, the tropical part of the world would be um, something that could be and that's a lot to reforest there. Yeah. A lot to reforest. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so could you expand a little more on the role of labor uh, within your uh, vision for this, these projects of yours? In particular, when you're converting from palm oil to palm sugar, what happens to labor in the, those interim years? And then perhaps also, is this a model that only works at the corporate scale, or? Is there a role for supporting smallholders as well? Okay, actually, uh, in, uh, yes, in the, there is a role for smallholders as well. Um, it will be a marriage with corporate, you know, corporations and, and smallholders. It will be basically 
uh, a, a relationship of, of mutual support. Because, I mean, not all of Indonesia can be corporatized. You know, there's a lot of smallholders around. In fact, there are 10 to 20 million, 10 to 50 million smallholders in the palm oil sector. So, you know, we have to be careful about displacing those people. But the good news is that the uh, palm sugar concept is very labor intensive. So, uh, our project in East Kalimantan, East Borneo, is to do 120,000 hectares. We will employ 50,000 people. We will need 50,000 people with a wage which is one and a half times the minimum wage, the, uh, the current minimum wage. So it's a living wage, that's, that's why I call it a living wage. In fact, it's actually more than a living wage. Um, so, yes, yes, it's, it's going to be uh, labor intensive. Now, the, 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 there's a reason why we have the cassava, because the cassava plant, uh, uh, the gestation period is 11 months. So you can harvest within 11 months. Palm oil is three and a half years. The palm sugar tree is six years. So we had to find a way of providing incomes for the farmers and for the workers uh, to provide cash flow for the first five years. You know? So Dr. Willie Smith, my friend, came up with a brilliant idea of cassava. And it works. Cassava grows, it's harvested within 11 months. It's a source of food, but it's also a source of energy. As anybody knows, cassava is a source of ethanol as well. So there, it's, it's, it's a model which we've developed and studied and planned. Uh, it's taken seven years. Seven years, but we had to find that happy medium. You know. And then, one thing which I, haven't, I didn't have time too much to talk about was the fact that we have these new technologies developed in the West. In fact, we're looking at the Dutch uh, technology, which can produce uh, what they call torcoal, which is torrefacted biomass turned into a, a, a material almost like coal but zero carbon, zero carbon. And then syngas, also from the same biomass waste, also from torrefaction. And so you can imagine producing plastics from wood. You know? Indonesia has the dubious distinction, Peter, of being the second biggest polluter of plastic waste in the world. I don't know whether you know that. China is the biggest polluter of, of the world's oceans. Indonesia is the second biggest polluter of, of the oceans uh, in terms of plastics. And I had experience of that in Chilinchin. You did? Because I couldn't actually land in Chilinchin, which is where the British landed. BBC are doing a documentary. Because it's just full of waste plastic. And while we were on the boat, crabs tried to get onto the boat because the sea is so acidic. They can't live in the sea. It's so polluted. So we have this exciting possibility now of, of, of producing plastic from wood waste. So you can imagine, you know, somebody throws plastic from by, from wood, that plastic would be great. Would actually be great within a few weeks because it's it's wood based as opposed to fossil fuel based. You know, now it's nothing. You know, bioplastics is nothing new. And in America, they have made uh, uh, plastic bags from corn. The difference is corn is a food. And as some of you from you know, South America, uh, I, I mean, some of you from Mexico, if anybody from Mexico, he knows this, that's the, that's, the, that's the source of tortillas and burritos, right? Uh, so it's, that's the, the, always the problem when, when you talk about biomass. When people talk about biomass, they, they associate with corn. And our biomass would be from wood, would be from twigs, from branches, waste wood. You know, and so, so it's very exciting to be able to preserve the industrial way of life, but from biomass. You know, for me, that's very exciting. Because otherwise, the prospect of actually doing away with, uh, with uh, plastics and petrochemicals because of fossil fuels, I mean, that's, you know, that's, can you imagine a world without plastics? Very difficult, I think. So much, is, so much in, a, in a supermarket shelf comes from, from plastics. But instead of plastics from uh, fossil fuels, you can have plastics from, you know, replenishable, uh, sustainable <coughs> uh, biomass waste. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Optimistic presentation. Um, when we go to to um, uh, sort of natural forests related to this 
three plant forests. Do you know sort of the ratio of the biodiversity in these three plant forests as opposed to natural lowland uh, rainforests? And and also how mm, how do you see some of the interplay between reforestation and sort of uh, stopping deforestation? And then again, uh, why wouldn't these sort of replanted forests be overexploited when natural forests are overexploited? Okay, actually, um, I, I don't know what the ratio is, frankly. Um, I do know that uh, natural forest is disappearing at a very alarming rate. I mentioned to you two to three million hectares a year. I mean, uh, unless, unless there's a very massive effort by the Indonesian government and other tropical you know, governments to prevent the destruction of a natural forest, you know, we're going to, we're going to, everything's going to disappear. Within 20, Indonesia, 25 years, no forest cover, you know. So um, I came from the other, you know, I'm a private, I, I have no influence over the governments, you know, the Indonesian government, and, and I have no way of being able to prevent that. Um, but I, I came from the other way. So, in, you know, this 80 million hectares of, of degraded forest, do we keep it degraded? You know, a degraded forest serves no purpose for anyone. In fact, it's actually detrimental. It doesn't become a habitat for human beings. It doesn't have a habitat for, for, for animals. So I came from a different point of view. So I don't have an answer to your question. I, I really don't know what the ratio is. But I think, um, I think we, we, will, we will be providing another solution. I don't know whether I, you know, I've answered your question, but uh, I don't know how I can answer your question. You know? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. <coughs> to uh, look at the effect on... Oh, sorry, sorry, and then your second, sorry ma'am, the second question is how do we prevent the ever over-exploitation of the <coughs> okay. that, that I think I can answer. Um, we think, I, I think I said to you, 220,000 hectares of forest would employ 55,000 people. Theoretically, if we were to do 60 million hectares of reforested land in Indonesia, it would employ 30 million people. There are not enough Indonesians to do that. In fact, we would have to import a lot of Rohingya from, from mm. Myanmar, uh, uh, Peter, mm. you know? Mm. Uh, and from maybe from other countries. I mean, in fact, I'm not joking. We may, may have to. No. So the answer is that it becomes in the self-interest of the local population to actually keep the forest intact because the forest provides the living. It provides the incomes for the local people. So in fact, it, 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 for me, it serves several purposes. One is that it prevents, it prevents the destruction, further destruction of rainforest. In fact, it keeps the new rainforest uh, um, more or less intact. But it also provides the incentive for human beings not to go after wild animals. You know, because one of the reasons why Indonesian, uh, Indonesians, villages, and common people go after wildlife, because they have no they have no uh, uh, living. They have, there's no, they, have, they have no assurance of making a living. So they go after orangutans and sun bears, sun bears for the bile, you know, to be exported to China, uh, orangutans uh, to be sent to the Middle East and others for us. Uh, there's a huge trade, uh, illegal trade in wildlife in Indonesia. Estimates are between one and two billion dollars a year. And that is because of poor people who have no uh, assurance of making a, a regular living. So we think with this model, the, the local populations would, in their self-interest, want to keep the forest intact, and therefore also not for, to, to, to disturb and bother the wildlife. That, that's uh, that's the, 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 the theory. And I think it, 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 in some modular studies worked out, in fact. The local population is the one that keeps the forest intact. The local population provides the food for for the for the the orangutans and the sun bears in the in the border there, it's worked out. It actually has worked out. Yes, sir. Yes, I wanted to know how you can bring the local population in on your site, because in every change in technology, there's usually a change in the education of the people, and so I wondered how that is built into your project. Um, yes, I think well, it's related to my earlier. Answer. You know, it's, we think that with um, with providing uh, a dignified <coughs> way of, of of living, 
uh, providing them a, a, a decent job, do you think we can give them the, the, the incentives to, to provide, to, you know, to, to prevent the destruction of, of, the, of the new recreated rainforest? Um, it's also education. You know, you, 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 I'm sure you, you know that Indonesia's education system is rated as one of the worst in the world. And I think you're alluding to that. Um, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. It, it requires the government uh, to do and, and to actually reform our education system. In the meantime, I think it, uh, it behooves private companies, and it's in our interest as private companies, <coughs> to, to try to educate the people within our areas. So there's so much, only so much we can do. But yes, I think the, the, the point is that it is an education. And you know, you know, you know um, I'm one of the few Indonesians who actually, uh, you know, they're, they're, there's a small percentage of the Indian population who actually care for wildlife. Uh, you know, I, and I'm sorry to say this, but most Indonesians don't really care for orangutans or sun bears or, or, or monkeys or primates. It's, it's an educational, it's an educational process. You know, and and um, I was accused once by a bupati. Bupati is the, the district officer, the district chief in Indonesia. We have 560 bupatis. And one bupati actually accused me in my face of loving animals more than humans. He actually insulted me by saying that. I, I, I was quite angry with this, with this man, and, uh, and, and I actually helped him in, in, in removing him from office. When, when, he, when he, he ran for re-election, I supported his uh, competitor. <laughs> and his competitor won. <laughs> and and uh, one of the things was that uh, his competitor, uh, the new Bupati, uh, promised to help preserve the wildlife in his area. Yeah. So yes, you know, uh, uh, you can imagine. It is, and it's not uncommon. This sort of <coughs> sentiment is actually pre prevalent in Indonesia. I mean, it's, it's actually, there's this conflict between animals and human beings. I don't see that. You know, I think it's, it, sh it should be an a symbiosis between animals and humans, but it's not, it's not universally shared in Indonesia. So it is an educational problem. It is. You know, there was a study done by Pearson, mm. the educational group, yeah. of um, the educational systems of 40 major countries mm. around the world. Mm. Uh, not surprisingly, South Korea rated number one. Mm. Uh, I think the United States was number 17. Japan was number five. And I'm sorry to tell my Indonesian countrymen that Indonesia was rated the worst. Ours was rated, but ours is the, the number 40 out of 40 countries. Below Peru. Sorry? Lower than Peru. Lower than Peru, yeah, well, mm. lower than most countries. Mm. Um, so I think, yes, that's a very good, a very good point. Yes, ma'am? Mm. Yes, you? Some names, you know, Richard Branson, Jeremy Grantham, George Soros. Um, I was, you know, I've been told, I've met their representatives, they're, they're very interested. Uh, these are just, I think, the start. And when other people see uh, that there's money to be made in going into this renewable space, then I think the, 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 you know, the others will come and see. You know, but it has to be profitable. You know, I, I mean, as I said, not that many businessmen are interested in doing what I do. Some are, some are, but m many are not. Most are not. But when they see the, you know, as a, the profit, the, the, as the profit motive being the driver, uh, you know, the, the, the driver, I think they'll, they'll come to see, you know, and I think that's, that's the, the solution that we provide. We think there's enough profit for everyone to try to do this, okay, because you know, the, the, the task is huge. I mean, 540 million hectares, you know, in terms of money, that's $1.3 billion, sorry, $1.3 trillion. You know, it costs $2,500 minimum to reforest one hectare of 
of degraded land. So um, it would cost $150 billion in Indonesia to reforest all 60 million hectares. Of course, if it's 88, <coughs> we're talking about 988 times two and a half, that's about $200 billion. Okay. Now, when you do it over 40 years, then the numbers seem to be more reasonable, doesn't it? Because you can't do 80 or 90 million hectares in one year. <coughs> and it will take 40 to 50 years to do it. Right? At the rate of 2 million hectares a year, it will take 40 to 50 years. Now, you take $200 billion over 40 to 50 years, then it becomes quite reasonable, right? Then it becomes what? $4 billion a year? You know? The oil companies used to make, used to make, before the collapse of the oil, they used to make $40 billion a year profit. Exxon made $40 billion. <coughs> BP made $25 billion a year. You know? Shell used to make $25, $30 billion a year. Per year. So when you talk about $4 billion a year, you know, it, that, that's, it becomes much more reasonable. Right? Yeah, in black, I guess, yes. Um, the, the, the answer is, uh, well, actually, we, we, we don't accept directly. The Norwegian government was asked, they asked McKinsey to do a project, to do their due diligence on us because they were interested in our project. And as a result of the McKinsey study, and they had become extremely interested in our project. My, um, my relationship with Norway was when I visited Norway two years ago to get their sovereign wealth fund to become interested in participating in our project. Um, that program that you've mentioned is actually from a different part of the Norwegian government. It's from the Ministry of Environment. The Sovereign Wealth Fund is <coughs> run directly uh, by the Central Bank of Norway. So it's a separate institution. Okay, so uh, the answer to your question is yes and no. Okay, uh, we, we don't do it directly uh, with, the, with the Norwegian Ministry of Environment. It was done to McKinsey to do a, a study on us. Um, and, and uh, yes, uh, the, whole, the whole purpose of my visit to, to Oslo is to get the Norwegian government to get, to get interested. Because the Norwegian government is very much, you know, green-oriented. Yeah? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really fascinating um, presentation. Can I just ask about Actually, it's been. Oh, sorry, I had a second yeah. question as second well. Question. Yeah. Related to, um, you said you have, don't have influence with the Indonesian government and that um, awareness levels on environmental issues is pretty low. Is that not the case for someone of, uh, who has your profile to really lead a public campaign in Indonesia on these issues? Yes. Well, yes, in fact. You know, um, I was encouraged by. In fact, I was encouraged by the, the reaction of the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. <coughs> As you know, they've been merged. The Ministry of Forestry and the Ministry of Environment have been merged in which is the one. You know, there, 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 there are arguments for and against that, but anyway. Um, so I was very encouraged by their reception, and they're very, very supportive of this idea. In fact, the minister herself, uh, the woman minister, she actually asked me to be part of her delegation to Paris. And she asked, she actually encouraged me to make the call. So yes, the Indonesian government is very much involved um, and very supportive. Um, However, they have no money for this project, so it, mm -hmm. it has to come from you know, private investors. There's no government investment at all for this project. Um, and land tenure, uh, in fact, I've had no problems with land tenure. You know, uh, we've, we've had, in fact, one of my forest concessions was extended by 35 years to do this project. And in fact, uh, a few years ago, the previous minister also offered me 10 million hectares. You know, Hashim, if you can raise the money, I'll give you 10 million hectares to do it. Uh, but that was a few years ago, and there were some issues. There were some other issues. Um, so yes, the, the Indonesian government is very, very re uh, you know, responsive, receptive. And, um, and land tenure issues, yes, that's a problem. Not for me. I, mean, I have to be very frank with you and uh, honest. I don't have any land tenure problems. The problem with land tenure is very acute for local tribesmen 
especially in uh, Kalimantan and other parts of the Dayak tribe, who have always had um, common ownership, what we call adat uh, ownership. You know, adat means customary ownership of, of land. They've had problems with their keeping the, the tenure of the land, severe problems. In fact, they've been the, the biggest victims of these palm oil you know, companies who basically you know, bribe government officials to get you know, so-called land tenure, where in fact the land tenure was held by the direct tribes before that. Yeah. So yes, it's a major problem. I, I don't have that problem. I, I'm the, I've been fortunate. We'll take one more question. There's one last question here. Jeremy Grantham's right-hand man, they're both 
very interested. We've talked to people who will represent uh, Richard Branson. I've been invited to Necker Island in June. Uh, I can't go there because I have to be with you then. My wife is there. Uh, so I've actually been invited to Necker Island to meet them because they're interested. They've heard of this concept. Uh, they've seen our vi uh, DVDs. They're, they're very keen. I'm sure they'll, they'll but, you know, once they see it uh, and they want to visit the uh, uh -huh. study, they want to visit Ichiku. They, they, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of people with a lot of money who want to do the right thing. Um, uh, you know, uh, most of them from outside Indonesia, by the way. So. <coughs> the actual wage that, that many of these people, because many of them get below the minimum wage. Um, and and our, pro, uh, our model, you know, it, it, it has as, as it's the crux of the model is, uh, you know, polyculture. It's, it's, uh, it's planting multiple species of trees. It's, uh, that's the concept. It's uh, the cassava tree, it's uh, uh, timber trees, but f including fruit trees. You have fruit trees, it's multiple species. Okay, so it cannot be it cannot be done on the palm oil model, which is monoculture. You know. Um, now, on the treatment of workers, uh, well, that's that's a matter of yeah. I mean, I, I think it's going to be the self-interest of these palm oil companies to treat their people right, because uh, you know, it, you know, it's uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, the best workers are happy workers. You know, uh, uh, much more uh, motivated to do the right thing. You know, so I don't know. I don't know what that's like. You know, I don't know what I have an answer for you. you know, but. Um, I think I think when people see that they can make a lot of profits and doing the right thing, they will do the right thing. Yeah, that's, um, there's no guarantee for that. You know? uh, they make a lot of profits right now doing the wrong thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Gosh. The <laughs> I have time. <laughs> okay. Uh, will thank you. I ask a question again. Uh, will the profit come primarily primarily from the um, from What's generated from the forest, or will carbon offsetting be part of the model? No, the most of it will be from the forest, not from carbon offsetting. In fact, in, in our model, we don't even assume carbon credits. That will be gravy on the side. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a short question: What could Indonesian government? If I were the Indonesian government, um, you know, Indonesian government owns a lot of forests, as you know, for Utami, uh, I would invite, I would invite investors to reforest government-owned forests uh, using my model. If I were the Indonesian government, um, and make a lot of money, you know, the Indonesian government can make a lot of money out of this by reforesting its own forests. It's own de de deforested forest, it's a degraded forest, because they own a lot of degraded forest. Uh, so that's one thing they could do without, with a stroke of a pen. A stroke of a pen. Yeah. Opening government-owned forests for private investors, foreign investors, um, invite all companies to invest in deforestation, use their surplus profits for that. Another 
other is center of excellence. So, uh, so, uh, so I, um, and my, my friends and colleagues at the center of excellence, I think, no, I mean, everybody has a center of excellence. You know, so maybe an R&D center will call us something. Um, but yes, so that's going to be uh, a research and development center. We want to develop the technologies and the know-how, the IP. And the idea is to basically export the IP to countries in Africa and South America, South Korea. Yeah. Is it primarily owned or is it shared? I mean, you'll be working with the... Well, the Norwegian, you know, the Norwegian government has expressed interest to fund it, to help fund it. Yeah. Yeah. They haven't done it yet, but they've expressed interest, so it's a matter of... But we're going to do it anyway, so we will come in to supplement us or to be an adjunct or you know, an associate. To, so so that's, that's the idea. Yeah. And McKinsey is also expressed interest to consultancy firm, the answer is coming from. Yes, I think yes, yeah. I know him. I know him. <laughs> <laughs> 
tells me he spends $2 million a year on his uh, wildlife. I mean, he's done a pretty, pretty impressive project in Lampung. In fact, mm. I, I haven't mentioned because I, you know, mm. I'm doing a similar project in my area in West Sumatra. So we're going to have a, a tiger sanctuary uh, to, for also for tapirs, tapir tapirs, mm. and for the Sumatran uh, rhino. We're going to have an area for these three, obviously separate from each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but, but so, so Tommy, Tommy is his project in Lampung. We're going to uh, do ours in Central Sumat West Sumatra, and I think another group is doing something in Aceh. So there will be three tiger sanctuaries. Tiger sanctuaries. Yeah. I, I think we're good. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Could we move into a more sort of um, to end the formal proceedings yes. by an exchange of gifts? And then, if, <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like then to, to sort of mingle and, okay. and, and, and yes. be available, okay. that, that then people could in a in more informal way. But thank you very, very much for something which has been obviously close to your heart and something which could be a magic bullet for many issues which are to do with deforestation, which is one of the major challenges. Mm. Certainly, in Ireland, it's a huge challenge, and monoculture is a huge problem. But this won't work. There. Sorry, in Ireland. In Ireland, yeah, because I, I, of I the, because of the nature. Well, I mean, all the forests were cut down in the 17th oh, and see. 18th oh, century oh, to prevent guerrilla attacks on British um, <laughs> settlers. Yeah, and, and, and to and build a royal navy, by yeah, the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and what has been replanted is monoculture, which is actually very boring and very destructive and you have periods of time where the whole hillside is denuded because everything comes down at the same time. Yeah. 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 So okay. without further ado, here's ah. a, a small gift in memory and in honor of the fifth <coughs> <coughs>